to do, just in case anybody wants to watch. All right, hi everybody. Um, it's a beautiful day today. I hope that things are going swell. It feels like we're in, entering kind of the stage of the semester where it becomes increasingly difficult to concentrate. Are you guys feeling that? And I mean, it, this normally happens around this time of the year, but now it's a very special, very tiring year. We didn't have a spring break or nothing, right? So it's, these, these are tough times. So if you're having a tough time, you're not alone. I'm having a tough time. I think we all are. Um, but again, you know, there are nice things happening. The flowers are blooming. There are a lot of flowers in Riverdale. I, I don't think I noticed this last spring. Um, maybe because I wasn't actually here very much last spring. I guess that partially explains it. Um, but uh, anyway, so how's uh, how's the week been going for any for everybody? Does anybody have any stories they want to share? You guys are all locked in and ready for this exam. Do you want to talk about anything before? So I guess first I'll say I'm going to lecture a little bit before we get started. The exam will be 730 and I'll be sure to stop at 720 to give you 10 minutes to just kind of take a breather and gather yourself. Um, so if I somehow lose track, remind me and I'll stop at 720. Um, we can look at the review sheet together. Um, where is the review sheet to be this one? Steven, did you all solid and actually showed up to the review session? And so you can all thank Steven. Thank you, Steven. Um, and so hopefully that was helpful for some of you. Um, and now we can do, yeah, see the chat's blowing up. Thank you, Steven. Um, we can do a version of that together here. If you have any lingering questions, you guys have any lingering questions you want to go over? Six perfections, yes. Um, so maybe I can ask you first. Do you remember anything about them? Some kind of thing, okay. Anybody else? Six perfections, where do they show up? Did we cover that in the review session, Steven? Wasn't it like the stuff that like 45 percent like the stuff like that yeah um so the six perfections are generosity morality patience courage meditation wisdom um and so yeah like steven said they're on the bodhisattva path they're part of the greater vehicle right so this is from the very beginning of this second part of the course, right? The first part of the course we did kind of like early Buddhism. And then the second part of the course, we start off with Mahayana, the greater vehicle. And so then if, you know, on the review sheet, it just says six perfections. That means you don't have to memorize each individual one, although you're welcome to if you want. And um, one way you can think about this is, you know, we had the, uh, the middle way for early Buddhism. Do you guys remember what that was the middle way between? Asceticism and indulgence. That's a good thing to remember. So that, that's from the last exam, though. That probably will not show up on this exam. In fact, I'll guarantee that it won't. Um, I guess you could try to shoehorn it in if you want to. But um, so in that one, it's all about balance, right? It's finding the middle way. It's doing the Eightfold Path. Remember the Eightfold Path, right? Four Noble Truths, all that sort of stuff. So that's all old news. This is new. This is not all about balance. This is not necessarily even about a middle way, at least not a middle way in terms of intensity. This is like dial it up all the way, right? For a bodhisattva to proceed all the way to enlightenment, not only should you be a little bit generous, you should be extremely generous. And remember, I told you a story about the Buddha in a previous life where he gives away his own family members. He gives away his own body parts, right? He takes his eyeballs out and gives them away, right? And so we see these really kind of absurd themes showing up in some of these stories. And you might be wondering, what's the point? And again, it's to demonstrate this incredible capacity for virtue. Have you ever heard um, moderation in all things except virtue? That except virtue part sometimes gets left off. But I think it's actually important to keep in mind, and that's what's being expressed here, is you can perfect a virtue by 
pursuing it in a very extreme form. Another example would be patience, where you're willing to put up with hardship. So for example, uh, the life of Milarepa, he's like carrying those heavy rocks and he's getting a bunch of sores on his body, right? That's not like the kind of patience required when you're just waiting for your friend at the restaurant and you showed up early or something or they're running late. This is like forbearance, like you're willing to put up with extreme difficulty. So all of these have that sort of connotation. Um, and yeah, so very briefly, briefly put, I think Stephen covered it. Um, these are virtues that you um, perfect along the bodhisattva path. Remember, I did the kind of bottom up moving along the path. So as you perfect them, you move up along this path and then make your way into Buddhahood. Um, so again, like we did on the review session, you can kind of draw connections like this would be part of the greater vehicle, right? The six perfections and bodhisattvas perfect them and all that good stuff. We could say more, but that's probably enough, right? Does that sound good, Toby? Okay, other, other questions? I saw one in the chat. Um, to talk to Garba Sutra and Nang Nak. Okay, so uh, those are big, big ones. Tagda Garba Sutra is an entire sutra, as you can probably tell from the title. We went over it this same class, so maybe you guys just don't remember the early stuff. What is Tathagata Garba? Well, here's we've got Tathagata is the one going thus. Garba means all these different things. How, what have we been calling Tathagata Garba? Buddha nature. Yeah. It's a little bit of a slant translation. It's not a perfect translation. And that's why in the translation we were reading, the translator chose to just kept saying Tathagata Garba. But as your blank faces are expressing, that's not a great word because it doesn't really mean anything to people, right? So we've been saying Buddha nature. It's this nature of the Buddha that is in, inside of you. Tagata just means it's another term for Buddha. Um, so what is the Tagata Karba Sutra all about? Well, it's all these metaphors. Remember these metaphors? So we could go through all the metaphors, but that would be that would take many, many minutes. So I think that's not worth it. Um, so is that pretty clear? Do you guys have questions about Tathagata Garba, about Buddha nature? Buddha nature. Sutra is another way you can think about it, Tathagata Garba Sutra. Um, Nang Nak, who is Nang Nak? Ghost? Yeah. So that one's a little later. If you're doing the extra credit, you should know Nang Nak pretty well by now. Uh, I think it's after that. Yeah. So that was just a couple weeks ago. Um, and I think this was, we were reviewing it, but this has all the main stuff. So yeah, Nang Nak. It means Miss Nak, Lady Nak. It's a, uh, a story that's from Thailand, or that's told in Thailand. Here's her shrine in Bangkok. Um, there's a lot we could say about it. I could tell you the whole story. We could analyze it together. But basically put, that's who Nang Nak is. She was a ghost. Her husband went off to war. She was pregnant. When she had the baby, she died during, during childbirth. And then when the husband came back, she sort of haunted him and killed other people and that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, it's the Wong reading. So if you're looking for a source on Nang Nak, that's where you look. Does that answer your question, Walter? Do you have other questions? While he's typing, go ahead. Yeah, where did that show up? You don't remember? Does anybody remember? Okay, good. So this is a lot of last minute questions, guys. I feel like um, as much as I'd like to do this, we got to cut it off at some point. Um, so the se seven branches thing we did last time. Um, actually, that was the same lesson. So what is this a part of? This is a part of Guru Yoga. And we went through this pretty quickly. So here's the title here, Seven Branches. What are the branches? I'm not going to ask you to list them off. It's basically the details of how to do Guru Yoga. Yeah, Marva Miller, Ray, but we'll, we'll cover all that now. It sounds like Walter's trying to cram it in right before the exam, so that's good. Um, 
so why don't we transition to the lesson I planned for today, and I can actually cover all the things you guys are asking about. So this is a good transition. Um, so last time we talked about spiritual friends, right, and following spiritual friends, and what does it mean to follow a spiritual friend? Do you guys remember the book that we read for last time, what it's called? That would be a good thing to know <laughs> for the exam you're about to take. <laughs> um, it, this is something people often overlook, right? It's like, oh, I just need to know the content. But if you don't know who said it, then you can't really talk about it on an exam. You know what I'm saying? And you might have noticed, I asked you where do quotes come from? If you don't know the names of books, then you also can't really identify them. So this is, again, an important question. So what did we read for class last time? What is the name of the book? Or who was the author? Either one. It's like a weird name, yeah. So that was close. <laughs> um, so it's Patro Rinpoche. And those, you know, those are Tibetan words. That's hard to remember. Words of my perfect teacher, though. That's not hard to remember. Because especially he's talking about perfect teachers, right? That's exactly what we were reading about. So that should be pretty easy to remember. Yeah, Alexander remembers. Patro Rinpoche, words of my perfect teacher. So that's the source for all of this. Patra Rinpoche, there's a guy there. Um, spiritual friend, we talked about that. What is a spiritual friend? It's a teacher, right? And I asked you guys to think about teachers in your life. Remember when we talked about teachers in our lives and had sort of, it was actually a really nice conversation. I, I wasn't sure if you would really run with it, but it was open to the point that, you know, if you wanted to, there's a lot you could say about it. And it was good to hear, you know, that folks were, um, you know, feeling, feeling grateful or feeling happy about having such nice and helpful teachers. And it is a really nice thing to think about when you, when you do think about it, right? So what is this all about? Is how do you find a good teacher? And again, there's no admissions office. There's no HR department. You had to do it yourself, right? The teacher and the student had to kind of do these negotiations themselves. So what do you do? You examine them. What do you examine them for? Bodhicitta, do you remember what bodhicitta is? What's bodhicitta? So that translation was good, the spirit of awakening. It's a little more specific than that. And again, this is like the main characteristic of a teacher, thought of enlightenment. Yeah, that's a good way to translate it too. Mm -hmm. Very good, yeah. So if, if you folks playing at home can hear, it's the initial motivation um, to achieve enlightenment, not just for yourself though, Right? I mean, that's pretty good, too. But this is even bigger because it's part of the greater vehicle, right? So who is it for? For other sentient beings, for all sentient beings. Remember, greater vehicle, right? You got to go big with this one. So all sentient beings, which is really kind of unfathomable because it includes not only like all the humans, which is already unfathomable, but also all the bugs and all the animals and all the other beings that we can see here and then all the invisible ones too so it's pretty crazy stuff um and so anyways yeah we should find a teacher who has this motivation so that's good it sounds like you guys are on the track there then follow and we talked about stories of how to follow a teacher we talked about pure perception you remember this what is pure perception I'm glad we're taking this time together today, <laughs> Steven. Yeah, right. And we, I think, I, I tried to make a case for it last night. You know, it's difficult with this class because I know it gets pretty late. You guys get tired and it's just like turning off at, at a certain point. But, you know, here we are. It's what we got to do. Um, and so I was trying to make a case for it. It's kind of an unattractive idea, though, right? And so... Um, pure perception, like Stephen said, if you can hear him, it's trying to see your teacher as perfect. Can anybody remember the case I was trying to make? What would a maybe a positive aspect of pure perception be? Why would anybody ever want to do this? Okay, well, let's keep thinking about it. Um, here's an example of a relationship where this happened. And this it comes back to Walter's question about Marpa and Milarepa. Here they are. Hey, it's almost like we planned for this. So 
Uh, Marpa and Milarepa, what, what is their story? Who is Milarepa? Let's start with him. Who's Milarepa? Okay, good. So Stephen said he was a wizard. He remember we watched the creepy video, didn't we? Watch cre creepy video. He was like summoning up these spirits and sending them off to murder people. Remember that? That's why I show you these videos. It leaves you know a little more of an impact, right? Um, so here's Milarepa. He did all the bad stuff. He murdered people. He was a sinner. Um, but then, like Stephen just said, he found his teacher, which is Marpa. And Marpa put him through all sorts of hardship. Remember that? And so, you know, again, I actually I mentioned a moment, a moment ago, carrying all the heavy rocks and piling them up, right? And building the towers and then taking them down again, building them up again. So a lesser student, you know, someone like me, would be like, you know what, Marpa, you're kind of a jerk. I'm out of here, right? I would see this behavior as abusive because it is, and I would get the hell out, right? As most normal people would. But Milarepa had this pure perception of his teacher, no matter what his teacher did to him. And he did some pretty extreme stuff, right? And there are other stories, right? Do you remember Naropa? So Naropa, again, was Marpa's teacher. So there's a long line of teachers, actually, they talk about it here, whose lineage is like a golden chain untarnished by any variance with the vows. So um, this golden chain lineage that theoretically goes all the way back to the Buddha is how they thought about it, right? So here's like the, this, the original teachings coming straight from the source. Well, maybe not straight from the source, but through a long line of teachers from the source all the way down to me. And so again, Milarepa is getting these teachers from these teachings from him. He got them from Naropa. Naropa, if you remember, his teacher was Tilopa. And he was even more abusive, right? These are like really kind of horrible stories in a way. Um, in the case of Milarepa, though, it almost makes sense, right? Can we make sense of why Marpa was so tough with him? What's sort of the logic of this story if we want to interpret it from within the tradition? Exactly. Yeah. And I might have even used that term last time. I think that's right. Um, and again, if you see this as a red flag, you're right. It is a red flag. So I'm not saying, you know, do this or anything like that. But it, it's important to understand what how the tradition understands itself. Right. So, again, if you can hear what Sophie said, uh, he had all this bad karma. Remember karma? Right. He had all this bad karma. If he had died at this moment, he would have gone straight to hell because he murdered a bunch of people. And so what? Marpa was doing was forcing him to go through this hardship so that he could purify his karma and then he achieves enlightenment in that in that lifetime. How does he achieve enlightenment? He does this guru yoga practice, also a bunch of other stuff, but um, he imagined his teacher as perfect. He eventually kind of cultivated this perfect image of who he wants to be, right? It's not only who is his teacher, but it's who does he want to be. He himself is all messed up, right? And again, this is why it's such a great story, is I'm all messed up. I'm not as messed up as he is, but I'm still pretty messed up, right? And I imagine you guys, in your heart of hearts, feel like you're kind of messed up sometimes, right? Maybe not all the time, but, um, you know, we're all sort of messed up in a way, right? We have messed up lives and thoughts and emotions and feelings and whatever. But you can imagine someone who is perfect. We don't do this very often. Maybe we do with, like, our... I don't know, reality TV shows? No, maybe the appeal of those is they're imperfect, actually. But there are perfect stars out there. Keanu Reeves, for example, he's pretty perfect. I think we could all agree on that, right? Um, so we can imagine a perfect person out there and then kind of try to merge with them, right? Take on that perfection onto ourselves. The only way you can do that, though, is by first imagining. So anyways, that's what this practice is all about. It's just like deity yoga. Remember deity yoga? Who was the deity that we did deity yoga for? It was Tara. Yeah. So it, it's, it's the almost the exact same practice, right? Yoga means to merge. Did we talk about that last time? I think we did. So rather than merging with Tara, 
Here you're merging with the perfect teacher. Remember words of my perfect teacher? You're merging with the perfect teacher. That's the main practice here. Um, so we're not going to go over the details again, but these seven branches, this is where they show up, right? And so if you go back to the Pacha Rinpoche, words of my perfect teacher, you can find more details on that. So, so that's pretty good. Um, let's, uh, we got 10 min minutes for a little new stuff. I, I promise this isn't big on the exam, but it, it, it is on the exam in the sense like we've been talking about this pure perception for a few classes now. Well, I guess I should say for one whole class and then this sort of mini little baby class, there's one more kind of hot take on this relationship, the teacher disciple relationship. It's Rita Gross, it's who we read for today. So hopefully you had some time to read it. If you did not, I can try to summarize it for you. Um, you know, it seems like a bad use of time, but I think her story doesn't really make sense unless we watch this video. So let's watch it. Um, maybe we can just watch part of it. But um, it's about her teacher, right? Because this is about the relationship between a student and teacher, I feel like this is worth spending a little time on. He said to me that he felt that he was a critical point in his life. He said that I'm on the verge of becoming enlightened. And when people get to this point, they either go crazy or they attain realization, which of course made me feel a little bit anxious having just married him. So just in case you missed it, this is a British woman talking about a Tibetan monk who came to England, I guess it would have been the 60s. I don't know, is there a date on here? I don't see it. but. Um, yeah, I don't think so. So, and then they got married. And as you can tell from the headline, it's a bit of a scandal, right? So this is this is the teacher we're talking about, is this monk who came to England. Supposing if you become enlightened, then what? He said, you know, the job of a teacher is to insult you, to insult the ego. Well, we're talking about someone who was rigorously trained to understand the highest teachings of Tibetan Buddhism fled the communist Chinese invasion of Tibet, got himself into Oxford to present these ancient teachings in a brand new language to an alien culture, the English. I had heard he hadn't been the best driver in the world. He was driving with a girl in the car and I don't know if alcohol was involved or not. This car accident was to him a message that he had to completely strip himself of all facade and present the teachings without any props of robes or being being the great Tibetan Lama. Let's go see the Lama, he used to say. When you talk to them with the robes on, they don't look at you, they don't listen to you, but they look at your robe. So in 1970, with a one-way ticket to America, he landed smack in the middle of spiritual longing and confusion. <laughs> Maybe that's enough. So he, he comes to America. He opens uh, a Buddhist university there. They actually have a line about that somewhere. And it is called Naropa University. We know about Naropa, don't we? We just talked about him. Um, so anyway, so this is the teacher that this article is about. Um, there, we, we don't really have time to go through it in a lot of detail, but there's kind of two main parts to it. One is about... Um, how her teacher Trungpa Rinpoche was known to have to sleep with his students and you know students plural and she actually has a pretty hot take on it to the point where I think it's a little too hot to be honest I mean so this is coming from the late 90s it was 20 plus years ago um it was before the Me Too movement the Me Too movement did happen in Buddhism and it was pretty gross it still is pretty gross there's a lot of gross stuff um, not, you know, not to play on her word, let's say disturbing. Uh, and I wonder what Rita Gross would say. She passed away before any of that. She was kind of this hippie, hippie era uh, practitioner of Buddha, Buddhism. Um, I think her, her hot take on the sexual partner thing is not as interesting as her ideas about natural hierarchy. So if I may, maybe we can skip to that. Um, here is Trungpa Rinpoche, you know, very nicely dressed. Like I said, he was initially a monk, but then he, uh, di what, disrobed, I guess is the word. And people knew he was pretty crazy. 
and stories have come out since he was alive showing that he was even crazier than I had initially imagined. He would like get drunk and give teachings or sex, drugs, rock and roll. A lot of drugs, like one of his students got locked up for cocaine trafficking. Pretty crazy story too. So crazy guy, right? Very much a product of like the 60s and 70s in, uh, in America, I guess initially in England and then he came to America. Um, so what is the nat natural hierarchy thing about though? We got five minutes, that's plenty of time. So um, I would make you dig through the article to figure this out. But again, I think since time is short, I can just explain it to you. Um, what we're talking about is kind of a difference between like a, a pyramid and a circle. So a lot of the time, I'm looking at page 246 in the article, if you want to follow along, 246, 247. Yeah, the bottom of 247, we kind of get a, a definition of natural hierarchy. Um, so anyways, a lot of the time hierarchy works like this, right? We have kind of like somebody at the top, let's just say it's the teacher, right? It's me. I'm at the top of the hierarchy. It makes me feel very good about myself. Or it could be the CEO or whatever, right? Some sort of boss, the boss. Um, and then the boss has people under them and maybe people under them have people under them and it sort of forms this pyramid-like structure. Have you guys ever encountered hierarchies like this before? And, you know, I, I'm thinking of myself just because whenever I come in here, I stand up at the front of the room. Do I ever invite you guys to come up? I don't. What a jerk, right? Why don't I ever invite you guys to come up? That seems a little unfair, doesn't it? Um, and so the the structure here that that Rita Gross is trying to point out is that this is actually a bit rigid, right? It's unchanging, and sometimes that even causes a problem. You might imagine that whole pure perception thing feeds into this pretty nicely, doesn't it? Let's say the people at the bottom have pure perception of the teacher, then the teacher will be kind of the top of the pyramid all the time, wouldn't they? They would, right? Um, actually, Rita Gross seems to have a problem with peer perception. She says that she, she doesn't like it so much. So what she imagines is something called a natural hierarchy. Um, and so what is that all about? Well, that is not a pyramid structure. She compares it to a mandala, which we have right there. And we've talked about mandalas before, haven't we? Isn't that on the review sheet? Probably on there. What's a mandala to? It's like Yeah, and so we've only seen it in terms of Buddhas. And this, if you look very carefully, there's some Buddhas in the middle. Um, there's actually two Buddhas here. There's some Buddhas all around, Buddhas in all directions. And it organizes the space. It's a power relationship, just like the pyramid was. But what this, what Rita Gross is arguing, is that this is a bit more fluid, right? Where, for example, I'm the teacher in this classroom. Why am I the teacher in this classroom? It's because I know more about Buddhism, right? This is Buddhism class. And, you know, I'd be happy to share the stage with you guys. Honestly, if you want to come up and say some words sometime, you're welcome to. Um, and in fact, I actually do. I, I mean, I give you the microphone. I don't invite you up to the stage, but I do ask you guys to talk probably more than you want me to. And so, what is a natural hierarchy is where this middle actually can shift depending on who is qualified, right? It's actually a pretty simple concept. So for example, you know, I'm the leader of Buddhism class, but am I gonna be the leader of like engineering class? No, I'm not. I'm not an engineer. I don't know how to lead engineering class. So somebody else can kind of take the, the center stage when it is time for engineering class. I don't know if any of you guys are engineers. Any of you engineers? Steven's an engineer, okay. So when, it, when it's engineering class time, I'm gonna sit on the sidelines, Steven can come up and he can teach us engineering class. And so um, this whole idea of natural hierarchy, according to Rita Gross, is basically just giving whoever is most qualified the space to be a leader. Seems pretty simple, right? But it, in fact, it very rarely plays out this way in, in our lives. Um, Rita Gross also calls herself a feminist. Maybe this will be my last point. What would be feminist about this structure? What is more feminist about this natural hierarchy than the more rigid 
pyramid structure we talked about a moment ago. Is being a white man, does that make me more qualified to teach this class? It does not, does it? And so she's highlighting criteria other than what you look like, what you are, right, so to speak, right? Um, highlighting other criteria that will determine who gets to lead the show. And she talks about, you know, how to serve a table and then also how to receive such service. I think that's really nice, right? I don't know if you guys have ever been waiters or waitresses, right? But it's, it's a very humbling experience to serve people, but then also learn how to re receive. And so constantly shifting these values, con or constantly shifting these roles based on the characteristics that people have. That's, that's the bottom line that she's arguing for here. Um, yeah, it's fluid, allows for service, middle way between absolutism and the kind of democracy that ignores merit. I think that she, she's, again, pretty spicy uh, in her hot takes. You know, she's got some pretty hot takes here. She talks about, you know, ultra democracy where everybody is, is above average and all of a sudden nobody is above average. And, and she feels like people like her, you can kind of read into it, uh, fall into the, back, into the background. Yeah, it's a meritocracy. Yeah, basically. Um, okay. It is now 721. Why don't I give you guys a little break? Any last questions? Uh, I feel like I was able to go over Walter's questions, right? I got Marvin Milarepa. Um, any last other questions before we take a break? Okay, let's take a break. I'll turn the lights on. Intermission. Um, and then at 7.30, we can 